I go to the bar that I used to work at, and it's a wreck. It's right down on Fort Lauderdale Beach in front of Shooters. It was the hot corner to be in. And the landlord's in there, who was the fellow's father that used that would the fellow that had the bar was his father that actually owned the building. I walk in there and I said, "Oh, hey, Mr. Jacobus, you know, how, how you been? You know, things don't look the same." And he's telling me that his you know son's gone through this big issue with you know stuff that people in the bar business get into. And he looks at me, he goes, "If I had twenty grand cash right now, he goes, I'd walk away from this thing." In the dry cleaning business, you cash heavy. I was like, "Really?" So I went home, I put 20 grand in a bag, I brought it back to Mr. Conus about an hour later, and he laughed and he walked out the bar with the money. And I'm young, you know, I don't know nothing. I had to go back to Massachusetts the next day. So I call my best buddy Vinny up and I go, dude, I bought that bar. He goes, what do you mean you bought the bar? I go, dude, Fran O'Brien's like, I just bought it. Mr. Conus just freaking gave me the key and walked out of here. I said, I gotta go back to Massachusetts tomorrow. I said, come down here, I go pay up your bills you got. He go call me at the end of the week, let me know how you make out. So he did. And I go back to Massachusetts, and I had about another year to wrap things up, and then I sold everything and then moved back to Fort Lauderdale. But my whole mission was to make the cash so I could fish. Hey, there's Captain Jeff Maggio. They call me the Lunker Dog, and you guys are on the Tom Rowan Podcast. Today's guest is somebody that I have been following for a long time. I would consider him an early adopter of social media. He has been doing stuff on social media since before there was social media. Back in the days of Ustream, of forums, of all kinds of things that eventually evolved into social media, but they weren't really social media at the time. Forums, all these different things. Today's guest is none other than the Lunker Dog himself, Jeff Maggio. Jeff is a very interesting guy. He's been doing all kinds of stuff. He's a full-time fishing guide working in the Miami area. He catches a lot of tarpon. Really interesting guy. I love the conversation. We talked about all kinds of things from, you know, what it looked like to to, uh, be in the very, very earliest days of YouTube to what it looks like today. Stay tuned for a great conversation with my friend, the Lunker Dog, Jeff Maggio. All right, I've got the Lunker Dog, Jeff Maggio. What's happening? Ah, nothing. It's funny. We're doing the podcast up here on the Miami River. We were fishing right out here last night. Is that right? Yeah. This, this to me, like we were talking about uh, before, there's somebody fishing right there, is so foreign. <laughs> like, I never... The closest I would come to fishing around something like this would be, you know, close to the cruise ships or something on uh, in the Key West Harbor. But I mean, this is this is pretty cool, and I would imagine that I mean the fishing here. I, I know nothing about it, so you're tarpon fishing here and doing all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, well, mostly tarpon fishing. I uh, I used to do a lot more other stuff, but um, right now it is all tarpon fishing almost. Yeah. Well, yeah. of course, this time of the year. Well, I, people come from all over the world, and they want to target the tarpon. And between here and Fort Lauderdale is one of the few places that you can do it 24-7 year-round. Mm-hmm. So I've noticed, you know, in my bookings over the years, that most of my repeat business is tarpon fishing, which is cool for me because yeah. <laughs> that's my favorite stuff to fish for. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, doing this you know, trying to get by on the East coast over here, you know, you, you go with what works. Right. So why do you think it is that, that the tarpon are, are here and available? I mean, it's pretty simple. All, all year long. It's pretty simple. I mean, no matter what happens here, we've got the Gulf stream that pushes warm water in here mm-hmm. and therefore the tarpon are here. You know, people get pretty technical about it. Yeah. Tarpon like warm water. We got warm water. Right. It's pretty much that simple. So would you think that, that like when, when the tarpon leave, a lot of the areas that I'm fishing in the Florida Keys that they, you know, the, there was a theory that they would just swim to Africa or they would go, you know, on this migration. But it seems like, like, do you see that when it gets a little cool there, nobody's catching fish there anymore, that they're more here? Not necessarily. See, I, I personally, I think, I don't think anybody really has a good angle on tarpon. There's a lot of research and stuff out there, but I think there's so many different strains and I don't think they're on an annual migration. Hmm. 
So God knows what's going to happen from year to year to year to right. year. I mean, for the last couple of years, it was hard to find fish between 30 and 60 pounds. They were all over 60 pounds, mm-hmm. you know, big fish. This year, we're getting the 30 to 65 pounders, mm-hmm. you know, and it changes. They'll stage up in different places. They'll be bigger. They'll be smaller. They'll eat different stuff. It's got to be virtually impossible for it to be the same strain of fish coming by yeah. every year. Well, I don't, I don't see that we see the same fish either. Like some are very dark backed, some have kind of bluish backs, some have kind of a brownish coloration. And then certain times of the year, it's almost all big fish in certain areas and it's almost all small fish in other areas. And then as the season progresses, the fish size gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we go later and later in the season. And that's the Florida Keys. I don't know how it works here, but I would imagine that it's kind of the same thing that you're, you're, you probably have a time of the year that most of your biggest fish in your career have come from. Is that true or not? No. It happens all over. I mean, maybe, maybe the tarpon come here like people come here. Yeah. From all over the world, all different times of the year for all different reasons. Because um, the one thing that I know about tarpon fishing between here and Fort Lauderdale is when you when a guy comes up and tells you that you want to fish in March and you want to fish on this tide on this moon, you know, with this bait and it's a, it's a winner no matter what. I kind of you know I don't say much, but I look at the guy and I'm like, all right, fish for him for another ten years <laughs> and see if you have the same opinion, right? You know what I mean? Because yeah, I mean, I, this is I'm 51, so we'll call it four decades yeah. of chasing these things around, and you know we've had a lot of changes here in South Florida, crazy changes. The fish keep coming. They change. And it's nothing like it used to be. But there's no rhyme to reason to it. Mm. It's funny with that with a certain amount of, of information, you might see a trend. And then if you get more information, then you might see that, wow, that trend only lasted like this. And, and over 40 years, it looks like this. And that's where you're coming up with, like, the more you know, the more you realize, wow, we don't really know. As much as we thought we do. I kind of look at it like the stock market. You know, if you invest a little bit every year, Mm -hmm. you invest a little bit every year, there's no telling how those investments are going to work. Mm -hmm. But at the end of 30 years, you're, you know, and you have been doing this for 30 years. At the end of 30 years, I know stuff. Yeah. You You can look back and that's where you start to see some trends. But then if you look back 100 years, then you might realize that that little, what you thought was a trend over 30 years actually wasn't (laughs) like it's just like you know the more you know the more you realize you need to know that's that's how it seems to me is like that that whole deal with education being cyclical like you know nothing you learn a little bit you feel like you know everything you learn a little bit more you realize you absolutely know nothing until you learn a little bit more oh okay now i've got it until you learn just a little bit more and then you realize you know nothing again and and this whole this whole cyclical process takes you through you know, a lifetime, hopefully for some people, other people, you know, feel like they got it pretty wired and they just stop right there. And you should feel like you got it wired at times. Yeah. At you times. Know? Yeah. You get into, you know, you get into rhythms, you get into cycles, maybe they're multi-year. And if you're fishing every day, you should feel like that sometimes. Mm-hmm. And then you get a nice swift kick in the ass that everybody <laughs> goes through and it never stops as long as your fishing career, you know, goes on, whether you're a recreational professional or anywhere in between, you are going to get kicked in the ass. Yeah. Can we curse? Yeah, you can. All right. Well, like some of them say explicit. I'm trying hard not to curse as much as I used to. I know to. that I know that you can do anything you want to on a podcast, but you it is important that you that you set the 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 thing right. Like if if it is explicit. You just got to let them know that you yeah, might curse. Yeah, but you can get kicked off. I got kicked off of I, of I this podcast got kicked off because I used a logo. Just the Apple logo yeah. in a in a picture which was promoting like this is where you can see it or watch it or listen to you it think or whatever. They like it, right? Yeah, no, they didn't like it at all. They <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden it was gone. Like yeah. everything disappeared. Luckily, I have good friends that uh, know a little bit about this, a little more about this than me, and they helped me to get it back re- reinstated. But boy, I mean, there's no messing around. So that's one thing that it's it's like a free service. So they make the rules. Absolutely. But you can cuss if you'd like to. I just <laughs> well, have I to remember like to, to put explicit on there. Yeah, I don't like to. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to cut back. And uh, that was kind of one of my New Year's resolutions. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, all right, you know, it's just too easy. You got to stop doing that. What makes you What makes you decide that you're going to cut back on cussing as your New Year's resolution? Your I, daughter? 
Yeah, a lot of things. Yeah. A lot of things. But, you know, like, I don't know. It's a funny, it's, I'm in a weird situation because never really was the goal for, for me to become like somebody that people recognize or notice. So I was always just myself, mm -hmm. even when we did all our social media or whatever. And um, it's not always the best to be yourself all the time. <laughs> There's a time you have to be a little more reserved. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. No, I definitely. I, I, I don't think I would want a camera on at all times. Um, but a lot of ways, that's where the world's going. I was going to ask you that because I want to know like where you how how where this all came from, because I've been following you for a long time. And for some reason, it's a it's an odd story for me because I was terrified of computers when I was a, a kid. I did not want anything to do with them. And I find myself having a computer and having one of the first websites of any any guide in the Florida Keys. And it was a weird thing that just kind of happened. It wasn't like I was interested in computers. I was actually really afraid of them. Right. And then along that line, then you start going to these different forums and all these different things. So for somehow, quite strange to me, I was kind of one of the early adopters of this whole world. And, and I've watched you do all of these different things, like from very early stuff right so where did that come from i mean like how did you even did you fish your entire life yeah well let's get my water the um dude it's it's so weird because growing up in downtown fort lauderdale i mean literally on uh where we grew up on los Olas bar los Olas boulevard literally 20 kids you know mm -hmm. and um very small community, but very fishy, a lot of boats, stuff like that. I was like, was never not into it. Like for instance, in 19, we moved to Fort Lauderdale in 1976. In 1973, 74 and 75, I was just a little guy, but my dad was in to bluefin fishing up in uh, Massachusetts okay. and we did a ton of it and I was always there and I was always into it and then my dad decided he was going to move to Fort Lauderdale so he could fish the whole year instead of just this bluefin season. Yeah. So we specifically moved from Massachusetts to Fort Lauderdale to fish. And I'm nine years old at the time. And I can remember driving into Fort Lauderdale. We live on these little aisles and there's these little bridges. Mm -hmm. And the first time I would come over the bridge, the first thing that went into my mind was, I'm going to get that bridge. My mom going to let me walk down to the bridge. <laughs> the second thing in my mind was Little League football. My brother was able to play Little League football in Massachusetts, and I would go and watch. Uh -huh. So when we were moving here, my mother was like, Lewis, in third grade, you can play tackle football in Fort Lauderdale. So the only two things that were in my mind was getting to the bridge and being able to play football. Uh -huh. <laughs> my dad took off in the Marlin scene, and... um he had some cash and he wanted to build a boat for himself that he could do this, you know, Marlin fishing. And he became friends with these Venezuelans and Puerto Ricans. And he got into the ILTA, International Light Tackle Association. So he would travel all over and uh, catch billfish. And I would tag along. Never missed pretty much any destination that he went hmm. to. I was always there. And then my dad built himself a boat that was really fancy. And all the fishermen liked it. So somebody wanted to buy the boat that he built. Well, he... Then another guy wanted to buy a boat. Then my dad started building boats and accessories for guys. And I was right next to him. So as my father learned how to fish and became more into the fishing community and being Fort Lauderdale, such a small place mm -hmm. that everybody knew everybody. And when I mean everybody knew everybody, it was a small community. Like Sosen would walk around the boat shows. He'd come into the booth. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Mr. Maggio, you know, good, nice to, you know, and he'd talk about the boats and Pavarama was like 19 at the time. Mm. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like 13, right? We're doing Mako's owners tournaments up and down the Keys in the East Coast and Georgia's there as a kid. And I know him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then as years gone by, I basically knew everybody and was never not in the scene. And then I get about 16 years old. And it's funny we're downtown Miami because the guy Marcos had a 54 Bertram and we put a tower on it and put the uh, fighting chair in it and all his electronics. And Marcos uh, had a company, I think it might still be here, Ilium Jewelry. He lives right over here. He's got a big uh, yacht brokerage company out called uh, Moran Yachts. Mm. 
But anyway, Marco was pretty young. He's like 35 years old. And he asked me if I would fish in some marlin tournaments with him. And because we had a house in the Abacos, I was pretty familiar with that side of the Bahamas. And I jumped on this 54 Bertram and we fished a tournament. We did pretty well. We caught some nice fish. And we won one of the Calcuttas. And at 15 years old, he gave me a little piece of the Calcutta <laughs> for being on the boat with him. That could be a lot. It was a lot of money. Yeah, <laughs> especially, I would imagine. Especially for me yeah. at that age. From that point, it, it, you know, it was like, wow, you, know, you get paid cash for, you know, for fishing with people. Then uh, Sosin and uh, this guy Tom Green mm, yeah. knew that I was into you know, the backwater fishing in Fort Lauderdale and stuff. So they called up my dad and they said, hey, you know, your kid catches a lot of fish down there. You think we can go out and we have these plastic lures we want to promote and maybe Jeff can take us down the intercoastal and do this and we can do that. And so we did. And that was the first time that I ever fished with the guys that I looked up to growing mm. up. And I was like, wow, they want to go fishing, with, you know, where I go fish, <laughs> which was totally deflating, by the way. Yeah. Well, they wanted to push these plastic lures. Yeah. So I take them down to the intercoastal. This place is hot water canal. Where we've been crushing the fish and I've been crushing the fish on live mullet and live shrimps. And there we go down there and I'm all excited to be with Sosin and Tom Green was my idol. Mm. I mean, the guy is just phenomenal even to this day. Mm. But uh, anyway, we go down there and they're throwing these plastic jigs trying to, you know, catch tarpon and snook. And I'm in the cockpit of, we went in a sport fish boat. I'm in the cockpit of the boat and I'm like, these guys, what is wrong with them? <laughs> We can put out a live mullet and crush them right now. But it wasn't about that. Right. It was about pushing the lure. And at a very young age, I realized that these guys that I thought were, you know, bigger than life fishermen. Yeah, not so much fishermen, but they're bigger than life. Yeah. Because they were on TV hmm. and they were in the magazines, which made you bigger than life. Mm -hmm. So growing up, I would, you ever heard the uh, story, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants? Yeah. That's been me. I mean, literally. And my dad, you know, opened up the doors like that. And then in this social media, YouTube filming stuff, best friend that I grew up with was really into film. You know, he wanted to be a filmmaker. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Panavision, you know, we were shooting in Super 8 when we first started, VHS, <laughs> okay. anything we could shoot. And I would come back from fishing or whatever, and I'd tell, I'd tell Lamont, I'd say, dude, I say, these guys, I go, they're not really that great at fishing. You know, and we would talk about it. And the term real guy came up way back. Like, these aren't even real guys. Yeah. Like, they're not even real guys. They can't even get a dozen. And then Lamont, with his artistic mind, would be like, say that again. What do you mean he can't get a dozen? And I'd be like, dude, Sosin can't get a dozen. He can't get on his bike, because that's what I thought of in the time, or in his pickup truck and go down in the street and get a dozen mullet to go catch the tarpon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, Lamont would make these short videos on VHS and we'd get our friends and my dad and his friends and we'd watch me and we would laugh and we would do <laughs> stuff that you would, you know, never think of. And, um, I remember Lamont coming over to my house. This has got to be 16, 17 years ago. And he's like, dude, he goes, there's this website online that'll host the videos. I had no clue he was talking about. So, uh, he's like, trust me, this is going to be cool. You're going to be able to type in an address and then the videos are going to pop up. Hmm. I type in the address on my computer, no videos. I get the site, but no videos. I don't have a processor that can even watch a video. Mm. On dial-up and long time. Right. And it would take us like two days to upload four minutes. Yeah. And then we would just pray that it wouldn't crash. Now, what was that? Was that YouTube? It was YouTube. Wow. But, you, but Google hadn't bought YouTube yet. Right. You know what I mean? And it was you know, more of a idea that they were going to try. Then obviously Google saw the value in it and then bought in, bought YouTube. At that point, we were already uploading hundreds of small clips and stuff. Huh. Yeah. And um, very similar to what's happened with the magazines, just happened before us in the last decade with social media. Mm -hmm. See, at the beginning, guys like Sosin would write stories about small boat builders like my old man or Merritt. Or Schwepke's that owned Mako, or you know Jose that owned Aquasport. I mean, we can go down the list. Rabalo. They were all owned by small people. We'd go to the boat shows. We'd actually put the docks together with one another. Mm -hmm. 
And we would laugh that we were all just boat cleaners at the end of the day. <laughs> because all we were doing was cleaning boats and right. making sure they were ready for the shows. So then, you know, later on in the magazine world, the journalism went away. They only wrote articles about the people that spent the ads, right. you know, spent money for ads. And the small community of boat builders suffered greatly because of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. They I mean, couldn't afford to do, you know, at the time, you know, the ads were eight, nine thousand, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a page. Right. We build one boat a month. You know what I mean? The numbers don't jive. Right. And then the boat shows got more expensive. And then all the small boat builders got pushed out. Very few left anymore. A few guys build really nice ones in the Carolinas. Roy Merritt still build them here in Pompano. But there was, I mean, I can't tell you how many families were building boats right here, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, when I was growing up. Hmm. Well, you know, as the, as the, as the, you know, the ups and downs in the boat business are very dramatic, you know. Yeah. A lot of the smaller guys never came up, you know, from some of the valleys because of advertising budgets, magazine coverage, boat show costs, you know. Mm-hmm. And then the prices of boats started going totally nuts. Yeah. And then you could finance boats, which brought in a whole nother buyer. <laughs> yes, I bet to, that was a huge change. Ah, oh, dude, I remember my dad, like, mad at the boat shows. People are going to finance these things? What is wrong? What, what could be going through their minds? You don't finance a boat. You know? He saw that as a bad thing. Well, yeah, because now the same dude that's looking at a jet ski is looking at your friggin', you know, $2 million you know, sport fish back then, too many of was a lot of money to spend, yeah. you know, the same dude. He, you don't want the dude that's looking for a monthly payment. The guy that bought a boat then was buying his lifestyle. Yeah. You know, like the guys I first worked for on these big boats, they were right there cleaning the boat with you, rigging baits with you, doing everything. Today, they don't do that. It's one of the reasons I don't work on the big boats anymore. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, I was never not in the industry. And I was never not on YouTube and social media. And I can remember Chip Lamont. I call him Lamont Jones. It's his, you know, producer name. But Lamont telling me, he said, Jeff, you don't post any of your fishing reports in the Florida Sportsman Forum. I didn't know what a Florida Sportsman Forum was. So another month would go by. He's like, dude, you didn't post. You don't even put your stuff. So I was a little embarrassed. I didn't know how to post. <laughs> You know? Yeah. So he shows me how to post, and then I start doing a whole bunch of stuff on the forums, and it explodes. And because of that, the YouTube channel is exploding. The best thing about all this, there's no money involved, and it's all organic. Mm. 100% organic. Yeah. So if you were into fishing, you found the Lunker Dog. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you remember your first charter that you ever booked online? Straight up online, no phone call. Just, a, just I can remember mine like it was yesterday. I told this story before, but it was the weirdest thing. And I've, I've talked to this guy since, and both of us thought we were going to murder each other <laughs> and throw each other in the bushes or something. I certainly thought that I was like, man, I don't know. This is weird. Like I hadn't met this guy. We just talked online and I'm just going to meet him at the boat ramp. Like that was weird. That was a weird thing. Dude, it's still weird today a little bit. Yeah, a little, but I mean, there's, I mean, it is, <laughs> there's a, you, you've done it lots of times. Like that first time was so weird. And I, I can remember this guy, he got into the fishing industry so well, I'm still in touch with him. And we met through the AOL fishing forum. It was called FBN. Do you remember that thing? <laughs> fishing Broadcast Network. And oh, it was yeah, only that on AOL. Yeah, that I remember. And they had these different little little places that you could go and they were like chat rooms and just like you're talking about it was completely organic there was no money involved there was nothing involved other than people just being fascinated that this guy's sitting somewhere else and i'm in key west and we are having a conversation on this screen that i used to be terrified of and that fbn deal that was a really big deal for me because I would actually like, you know, you used to go and, you know, turn on the TV, have a couple of beers. And now I'm finding myself, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be in here like, <laughs> and go into the computer. And now yeah. it's like, can't believe this, that I'm the one that's on the computer talking on the computer, typing like this, you know? Right. And, um, it was just such a weird thing, but, but, you know, the people, everyone that I got from that, 
was hardcore as they could be because they were seeking this stuff out exactly. just exactly like what you said that exactly. it didn't just happen it wasn't delivered to them that in those days it was as it was like finding you know a, a real niche magazine that was only available in a couple of places and you would be like okay you know wooden boat builder or whatever and you're going to build this canoe and you had to go to this special store to get that magazine and then maybe you could subscribe to it or something but just a different time for sure so you were interested in doing that because of your friend Lamont, Correct. but also because you're getting immediate feedback on it. You're booking charters. Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Because I did, I went through a few different phases. All right. Went from that teenage jumping on everybody's cockpit, running around the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Yeah. You know, then uh, when I finished college, I went to University of Connecticut. I always played football, so I had to split my time, you know, and um, my whole thing from the time I was like 21 to say 31 was I need to make big bucks <laughs> because I got to get a sport fishing boat and do what I like to do. So the first real job I ever got is I took over a dry cleaning business. Did you was, know anything about dry cleaning? I knew nothing about dry cleaning. Why, why was that something that you found yourself doing? Because my father grew up in the dry cleaning okay. business. One so of his, somebody knew something about right, it. One of his old partners was going bankrupt. And the reason is back then, um, the tech companies up in the Massachusetts area were laying people off by the thousands. Hmm. You know, Wang, Digital, Raytheon, they were all up there. And I mean, they were going through a recession and they were laying people off big time. The economy was horrible and he was going to lose these dry cleaners because he had a couple of big plants and his dry cleaners that were around all the tech companies were taking big hits and he didn't have the heart to fire people and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. My father says, listen, my, my buddy's going to lose his company. He says, I can show you how you can make some money. And um, it's funny because I was standing in front of the bar that I later on bought checking IDs mm -hmm. and my dad's giving me this conversation. I was like, well, okay, when? He's like, you got to get out of here like tomorrow. So I go up to Massachusetts and I look at the whole operation. My dad says, okay, you see the three stores that are making money? I'm like, yeah. He's like, keep those open. He goes, see everything else is losing money? He goes, you got to shut those down. So it's my first real you know, work experience. And I'm firing people and laying people off that mm. have been working for this In dry a strange town. Right. And I was just like devastated. And how old are you when you're doing this? 18? 21. 21. And, um, I mean, it's killing me. And, uh, the guy that ran the plant, Johnny Pasapia, hardworking dude. I looked at him one day and I said, dude, I go at the end of this, it's going to be me and you and these two stores over here. And it was <laughs> Johnny was the hardest working dude. So he's the guy that I, you know, hung to the closest. And, um, we ended up making some good money and, uh, about three years go by, pay the IRS off. Starts making money. I sell off all the old stuff that's losing money. And uh, I come back to Fort Lauderdale. And this is after working like 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, you know, for like two, three years. Mm -hmm. I would take small vacations. I'd come home and fish with my old man. And then I'd go back. And um, I go to the bar that I used to work at. And it's a wreck. Hmm. It's right down on Fort Lauderdale Beach in front of Shooters. It was the hot corner to be in. And the landlord's in there who was the fellow's father that used that would the fellow that had the bar was his father that actually owned the building. So I walk in there and I said, Oh, hi, Mr. Jagonis. You know, I go, how, how you been? You know, things don't look the same. And he's telling me that his, you know, son's gone through this big issue with, you know, stuff that people in the bar business get into. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me, he goes, if I had 20 grand cash right now, he goes, I'd walk away from this thing. In the dry cleaning business, you're cash heavy. Yeah. I was like, really? So I went home, I put 20 grand in a bag. I brought it back to Mr. Jagonis about an hour later. And he laughed and he walked out the bar with the money. And I'm young, you know, I don't know nothing. So uh, I had to go back to Massachusetts the next day. <laughs> so I call my best bunny Vinny up and I go, dude, I bought that bar. He goes, what do you mean you bought the bar? I go, dude, Fran O'Brien's. I go, I just bought it. Mr. Draconis just freaking gave me the key and walked out of here. I said, I got to go back to Massachusetts tomorrow. <laughs> I said, come down here. I go, pay up your bills. You got it. Go call me at the end of the week. Let me know how you make out. So he did. And I go back to Massachusetts and I had a, about another year to wrap things up. And then I sold everything and then moved back to Fort Lauderdale. But my whole mission was to make the cash yeah. so I could fish. Yeah. You know, I mean, my peers, I got a, 
dude, I need a 50 foot sport fish. I'm going over to treasure key with that thing. I'm going to fish tournaments. This is what's going through my mind. It didn't happen. I made good money. I bet got a nice place in Fort Lauderdale. I still live there today and I do very well, but not that kind of cash. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, then I meet this guy, Mr. Tupper through Lamont's mom. Lamont's mom used to work at this place called Ardell that sold really nice yachts, planes, you know, real high end stuff. This guy, Mr. Tupper had a 67 foot sport fish, which was big at the time and needed somebody to do. He was into that tread barda stuff. Mm the fundraisers and the boy scout tournaments okay. and you know, that kind of thing. So Lamont's mom hooks me up with Mr. Tupper. I start working for him 50% of the time. I have the bar that's going so I can do my fishing with Mr. Tupper and get over in that caravan. We went to the Carolinas. We did all sorts of tournaments and stuff. And then through that, I started guiding part-time and you know, I had the bar and uh, those were good hours to guide. Mm -hmm. but guys like Mr. Tupper and his friends, they wanted to catch snook and tarpon. So I'd put them on my little Carolina skiff at the time. We'd go out there, we'd catch snook and tarpon. Back then, you used to kill the biggest snooks you caught, hmm. throw them in the back of the pickup truck. At the end of the night, go, you know, 10.30 or so, go by the bar, see what, you know, how it's going tonight. And then I'd pull up to the bar. I'd have the snooks in the back of the pickup and make sure everything was going good. I'd go home, i wash up. i go back to the bar about 11.30. We'd wrap up at 2 in the morning, and that was kind of my schedule. Mm hmm yeah. <laughs> I need so, more sleep than that. Yeah, well, dude, I was 22, right. 24 and, years old. Yeah, dude, age. you got so much energy. And then, you know, to think that somebody's actually going to pay you to take them starping and snook fishing. So I just kind of did that for the longest time. Hurricane Charlie goes through Punta Gorda. Mm. And it wrecks our boat company. We moved to Punta Gorda 20 years ago. It's easier to have a boat company there and so forth. Charlie comes through and wrecks it. So the boat show stuff and the boat brokerage stuff that I would do and all that kind of came to an end. My dad was like seven years old and, um, you know, we had to make a decision whether they're going to rebuild the boat company or not. Now I'm doing fishing charters and have businesses in Fort Lauderdale mm -hmm. and he's doing that. And I'm like, well, I'm not doing it. My brother he just had two kids and was working for, uh, Pompanet at the time. So that was the time to kind of let the boat business go. Hmm. Yeah. That's crazy, man. That, that same hurricane Charlie, that was the, on, on those same days that you were doing that, I was in Venice, Louisiana, uh, at a redfish tournament, deciding I'm never doing this again ever, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because right? my my wife and my my b two boys who were babies at the time were um, in Key West, basically stranded there. Hurricane Charlie comes over, direct hit over Key West as a small hurricane, you know. But I didn't have a lot of experience with hurricanes there. You just hear hurricanes coming right over Key West. <laughs> And I just, Rich and I were doing those, those tournaments. We were in Venice. I just said, you know, I can't leave. She can't leave. It was a helpless situation. Right. Like I'm done with this. Never again. That was my last one <laughs> on that weekend. Yep. Yeah. Hurricanes were always something we dealt with here. We used to celebrate them as kids. Cause you'd get out of school. You get out of school. You go surfing. Yeah, you know, surfing would probably yeah, be great. Yeah, chase waves up and down the coast according to where the swell was heading right. or where it was getting. So, you know, we used to celebrate it then, and nobody really made a big deal about it. Now, geez, we get a little storm, and they close the bridges down. You're not allowed to go over to the beach anymore, and you know. But, yeah, it's just kind of the way, you know, the way things, you know, are now. Everything's so, so dramatic. So what happens when, after the, the boat business closes down, where does it take you there? Well, the boat business closed down, and um, Fort Lauderdale goes through some changes. The zoning changes. The little bar kind of went from making money from hand over fist to nothing. Really? Yeah. Because of zoning? Yeah. Yeah. Fort Lauderdale opened up the beach and on the river, you were allowed to go out and drink till four o'clock in the morning. We had to close two o'clock in the morning, which means people would leave our place at like midnight. Huh. So those two hours where you made 80% of your business, they're now packing up and leaving to go to a different part of town. What about when, just knowing that you're in the bar business in Fort Lauderdale, when I was in high school, so the, I graduated high school in 87. You probably did as well, 86. or 86. So those years before that, 85 to like 80, right. there, were, there were about five years there where Fort Lauderdale was the spring break capital of the world. Absolutely. And, you know, that's where everyone went. And then Fort Lauderdale just basically said, this is not what we want to be, I guess, but this, I'm, I'm seeing this from an outsider. Like 
all of a sudden just people just didn't go there. I guess they started cracking down on the, on the spring breakers and just decided, you know what, you guys can go do this somewhere else. This is a nice community and we're going to keep it that way. What was that like? Like when, I mean, from somebody that was there in those years, I mean, well, just so you know, it's still going. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, well, see, Fort Lauderdale was a small beach town. It really was. And yeah, I mean, you had to have some bucks to live there, but it was nothing, nothing like it is today. Mm, yeah. So the big money comes into Fort Lauderdale and they got different ideas. You know? Yeah. They're going to get their tax revenue, not from the little guy that had the bar on the beach anymore. They're going to get it from Marriott. They're going to get it from the W. They're going to get it from uh, West Trek at mm -hmm. the marinas now. You know, the little marinas were owned by guys like my old man when before. Yeah. Now West Trek owns everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. PMR, you know, Hunzinger goes in and buys that. I mean, everything's changed, and it's still going today. Every last piece of Fort Lauderdale is getting bought up by big money, and we still got we we still got a few neighborhoods that still look like but Fort there Lauderdale. Was a, there was a major difference though between every college in the country deciding that Fort Lauderdale was the was the destination that everyone's going to, and those movies. I mean, there were like movies like Spring Break, and Dude. and and the movies weren't couldn't even explain how cool and crazy it was oh. and then being 15 to 18 and growing up in it yes see the bridge i was talking about that went to, to you know down my street fiesta way there on los olas boulevard so the bridge goes over and that's los olas los olas goes down to a1a where the elbow room is and then you go down the strip to sunrise boulevard or down the strip to 17th street or up the strip to sunrise boulevard no matter which way you wanted to go to the strip it was wall-to-wall -wall traffic hmm. <laughs> i mean wall-to-wall -wall. From Federal Highway to the beach, from Sunrise Boulevard to 17th Street was just wall-to-wall -wall traffic. And the traffic would go right by that bridge. And we'd be sitting there fishing. And all the college <laughs> kids are in their cars drinking and hanging out and playing music. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, it was exciting. I mean, you were running around with the college kids, you know, when you were a junior and sophomore and freshman in high school. You know, it was, <laughs> it was good times. And you grew up quick. I bet you did. <laughs> I bet you did. Because back then, spring break was this was this time of just complete, just, I mean, it was it was hedonism. Dude, we were getting lunkers in people's faces back then because we were catching fish on those canals where the traffic was all backed up. Mm -hmm. And you have the big old Jack Ravel and you show that thing off because it was... <laughs> Yeah. There's people everywhere. <laughs> and that's how the old lunker in the face thing happened. <laughs> because in Fort Lauderdale, when you catch a fish, people see you. Yeah. You know? And, you know, I mean, every fisherman knows there's nothing more rewarding than catching a lunker in somebody else's face. <laughs> whether it's your friend or whether it's a stranger or anybody in between, there's yep. some gratification. Everybody takes pride in that. I don't care what they say. Oh, no, I don't do that. Everybody does that. And it's fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we start doing YouTube videos about that. Yeah. Yeah, then guys like you and then basically everybody who was into the fishing was like, wow, these guys are having a blast. What are they doing? They're catching lunkers in people's faces and then they're regurgitating the, and that was all organic stuff. And like I said, when you stand on the shoulders of giants, I had no clue what Lamont was doing. Hmm. Lamont could see it. He knew the message. He knew the vision. He was into filmmaking. You know what I mean? Me, I was into catching fish. Yeah, but there's a big difference between being into filmmaking and seeing the potential of YouTube super early. That's a big difference because there's a lot of people that are into filmmaking that poo-poo YouTube. Oh, no, no, you would never want to do that. You would never want to put your stuff on there for free. Why would you do that? You're taking an art form and you're destroying it. There were tons of people that were saying that. And then you had these other people that were early adopters that jump on. Same thing with social media, same thing with Instagram and Facebook and everything else. Like there's some people that if you share their photos, they get upset with you. And then there's other people that are sending the photos, please share this. Like, okay. Like, well, but there's a big difference. How do you think Lamont saw that? I mean, he obviously saw it. Lamont was in a position where he was able to use YouTube. Today, everybody's in the position where YouTube uses you. So how was he able to use YouTube in the beginning? Like to get, I mean, ob the obvious thing is you get charters, you get attention, no, no, you no, get no, 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 something no. else. It had nothing to do with that. Okay. The only thing it had to do with was instead of sitting in our living room watching what Lamont made, we oh. could now watch it online. Okay. Okay. That was 
the beauty of it all. So we never thought that a whole lot of people were ever going to see it. We just used it instead of like having the cassette tape in your pocket. Yeah. You know, instead of having the DVD that Bill Dan sends you, mm-hmm. we could have ours online. Yeah. You know, we had no clue about phones. We had no clue about any of that. All we knew was we can put more people in our living room to watch the goofy stuff that we made. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was, and, 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 and Tom, don't take this wrong because I'm friends with all the people that chase ad dollars. That never went through Lamont's mind. Not once in the first decade that we ever produced anything. The actually what went through our mind was the real guys out there, the guys that are really into fishing, there was nothing for them. And what I mean by that is all the TV shows and everything were so structured around their sponsors that the poor guy that was really trying to fish had nothing. Also, the guy that was fishing 200 days a year had nothing. They read those articles in the magazine. That means nothing to them. Yeah, it means something to a guy in Colorado that's trying to learn about bill fishing. Mm. But it doesn't mean anything to the guy that's been bill fishing 200 days a year. Nobody even knew those guys existed. Right. So this entertainment, this content that Lamont was making was for that. Mm. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. It was never about how many views can we get. It was about the people that we knew, the people that we dealt with, and then the cool content we could get was of course the big fish and the boats and yeah. the houses and the trips to the all over the world and all that kind of stuff. Do you remember the first one that that really exploded and and you guys looked at each other and were like, "What the hell?" Yeah. How did this happen? Well, a couple of things, a couple of things. One was the mullet run. See, Lamont was filming the mullet run before people even got on YouTube. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, we had it on VHS and stuff. And that was just a spectacular thing you know national geographic meets spring break mm-hmm. you know what I mean? yeah. and the mom was there filming it and we had it the other thing and it's funny because everybody does it now was cast netting mm. see when we started our trip we went out we got a dozen yeah. right? we went out we got our dozen baits and um nothing happened nothing happened until you got a dozen so we online and on lamont's content that's what we put on there it wasn't original everybody lots of people did that at the mm-hmm. beginning of their yeah. trip but nobody put it on tv you know what mm-hmm. i mean yeah so uh we do some cast netting videos it's just simply us catching bait and we start a side channel called the mullet run mm-hmm. and that was basically going to be our bait channel we're going to show how we catch bait where we store bait you know all the different tricks about bait yeah so that's where we could take the footage that was about the bait and we put it over there in the mullet run then you had lunker dog fishing and that was you know rod bending you know, Captain Jeff catches this, Captain Jeff is fishing with somebody, whatever, which was kind of like more of mocking TV shows. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because we would, you know, say whatever we wanted, curse, act like idiots, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So we were doing that and then we were doing the bait channel and then we look and we say, man, we just got a million views on that cast net video. We never, you know, thought that we were going to get a million views on a cast net video. Yeah. Okay. We weren't the only ones that saw that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Now, when you look at social media, you know, fishing content or fishing shows or whatever, they're always showing that. Right. Well, yeah. Now that we all know that people are interested in that and that's what's, you know, creating the, you know, the view, everybody does it now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And all of our content kind of worked that way. We have slang that fishermen all over the world use, you know, like run that dog. Mm-hmm. You know, or can you get a dozen or certified lunker? You know, I mean, and more. Why? Because in those early videos, we would say that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And then the real people would say that stuff. Then the whole salt life, you know, era came. Or who can be more salt life than the other dude? Oh, well, I know this slang that lunker dog says. So I'm going to regurgitate that everywhere because I'm salt life like crazy. And then we d- we saw that, and then we did a video called I'm So Salt Life, <laughs> where me and Lamont are just sitting in my garage talking about how salt life we are, just making fun of the whole thing. People <laughs> loved it. You know what I mean? But uh, you know, there were certain videos that, that you know, just opened up your eyes and, and, and just changed everything. Yeah. You know, and you never saw them coming. We get the 200-pound tarpon in the river, you know, and the kids reeling it in, and it's Best jumps, best footage, everything, and you get 10,000 views. 
You know what I mean? Yes, I know. Then I yell at a water taxi that goes by and goes through my lines, and I'm pissed at the top of my lungs, and I'm yelling at that dude. Lamont puts it on video, and two million people are yelling at the water taxi guy with you. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. And we didn't even, you know, we didn't even know. We didn't even know. Didn't care either. And that was the beauty of it all. But what I tell you, what totally floored me, and it just brought me to reality and uh, about what we actually had was um, I knew all the TV dudes growing up. Never got on TV. Huh. Not once. We were almost, we we got blown out. Yeah, we were supposed to do TV. And uh, yeah, it was probably better we didn't do it that day. But anyway, I get a call from Tom Green. And Tom's like, Jeff, he goes, how's, you know, how's the tarpon bite? And I'm like, well, you know, we're going into the spring. I'm still crushing them in the river here. He says, okay, he says, uh, Bill Dance is going to call you. He wants mm-hmm. to do a, a, a fishing video down there. I'm like, Bill Dance? I said, I love Bill Dance, but he's a bass dude. But Tom Green just called me on the phone, who was my Bill Dance growing up. Mm-hmm. Guy I respected most. The guy that, you know, I'd show up to his shop and there'd be a 30-pound snook in there. You know, we traveled to Venezuela together to do ILTA tournaments. I mean, this is in the 80s before people did that kind of stuff. And Tom Green was always bigger than life, who introduces me to the guy from Momoy who knows Bill Dance that wants to fish with me in the river in Fort Lauderdale. And that made me step back. I was used to the rich Marlin dudes and the guys that were around Fort Lauderdale, you know, that wanted to win a tournament Mm -hmm. that was interested in doing that. But I was not ready for that. And then everything kind of changed after that because then I got on TV. They saw more of the YouTube People weren't doing YouTube at the time, and it totally just, you know, went nuts. And then I started doing TV with a whole bunch of different dudes. And it was, you know, it was like all the stuff that I used to get pissed about with the journalists, you know, and what they wouldn't write about and who they would leave out and the stuff that they would write about. And it would, you know, irritate me. It was all coming back, (laughs) you know, because of social media. Yeah. And the coin was flipped. And now it didn't matter. If the magazine wrote about you, the TV dudes were coming to you because of your exposure from social media. And then there was no, you know, um, gaming the system like you can game the system now with the algorithms and the type of content that you put up. You know, people say, oh, Jeff, you know, how how do I uh, how do I get really good at my uh, social media, my my YouTube channel? Do shark videos, do Goliath grouper videos. Maybe you can get a porpoise sea turtle will do real well but the last thing you want to do is go catch a 15 pound snook yeah it's true (laughs) i know you know if you're in if you're minnesota and you're a fisherman or whatever i don't know when you're ice fishing look something that's frozen metal get your stung your tongue stuck to it you'll get Mm -hmm. 10 million views yep you know what i mean (laughs) so you know everybody that wants to know how can i do better on youtube how can i do better on social media Sadly, you missed the boat if you were a real guy, because now it's not about that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And dude, it was a good ride. You knew it wasn't going to last forever. You knew money was going to get in, you know, in the way like it always does. So we got to move on. We got to be ahead of the game. So what's next? What we're doing right here. You think I'm down here for nothing? (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) You think I'm down here for nothing? Can we talk about how this thing transpired for a little bit? Because I got to tell you, it was a little bit of a roller coaster for me, and I'll tell you why. So when we first talk, well, let me go back just a step further. I'm listening to uh, the Salt Strong podcasts. You guys, and I'm friends with Joe and Luke, and um, I'm working out. Every time this time of year, I try to lose about 10 pounds because I know I'm going to bang out 150 trips in the next five months. So it is always good for the back and stuff. And I'm listening to the Salt Strong podcast, and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's Tom. And. You know, I'm really kind of enjoying it and everything. <clears throat> and then uh, I'm thinking, I'm like, I haven't been online and uh, got into any content in a while. Hmm. Matter of fact, I kind of had like social media overload because there's so much crap that you have to filter through. Yeah. And then Facebook and YouTube and all these, they're not helping you, dude. They're helping the guy that's licking the frozen light post. They're helping <laughs> the guy that's doing the Goliath video. Why? Because the algorithms you know, can generate these huge viewing. The more viewing, the more they can build. The more they build, the more crap that comes out. Yeah. But you can't fake this, right. what we're doing right, right. now. Well, that's, I, I think that, that what I've noticed about um, 
the podcast is that it seems like the more things go towards this tiny little bite of information, like the more the more popular Twitter becomes, the more popular Instagram becomes, where it's this quick scrolling through, the more a certain percentage of the population wants not that. Like they don't want the Cliff Notes version anymore. They want the full novel. And I also think that, you know, one of my frustrations has always been when the television show is that everybody wants more instruction. Okay. That's fine. I like to give instruction, but you only have 22 minutes and 30 seconds. And in that 22 minutes and 30 seconds, there are bumps to break. There's an intro. There is an outro. There is all of this graphical element. There's a tackle zone. There's all this stuff. And so it's really like 10 minutes of fishing. And in 10 minutes of fishing, you hook, you cast, you hook the fish. There's some fighting and you land the fish and then you let it go. And that's like seven minutes. Right. So now, Maybe you fit in two fish and there's very, and then you have to have some kind of storyline that, ro- that rolls through the thing. So if you have a guest, forget about it. That's one of the reasons why we have very few guests is because once you have a guest, a guest is a great thing to have when Except the fishing is horrible yeah. because now all you got to do is catch one fish and tell the story about your guest. And now there's no time for anything else. The worst thing for the editor is when you have an interesting guest and the fishing is awesome. Because now there's way too much to work with, and this should be a five-part series. Right. And nobody wants a five-part series either. So I've always thought, well, I think people want more. They want more of what they're interested in. If they're interested in you, they want to hear the whole story. And what's really interesting is if they can hear a, 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 a part of the story or the whole story or even just a little piece of the story that you've never told before right. for some reason. And the only way that you're going to, that I'm going to hear that story that you've never told before is sitting down and talking to you for two hours and relating all of these other stories. Oh, you know, Mark Sosa. Okay. Tom Green. Yeah. He's a friend of my, uh, of one of my lawyer clients that I've had told me about him for years. And then that spawns, Oh, well, Oh, I know that guy. And then you start going on down these different ro- roads. Right. And then here comes a story that you've never heard before. Right. Or that you're you're thinking, I haven't told that story in 20 years. Yeah. That's the gold. And that's what people are 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 super interested in. And each, I don't know, I've enjoyed the podcast. And, and I enjoy it to the point that I probably talk about how much I like it too much. Because, like, for me, you and me sitting in this room doesn't ever happen. Right. It doesn't happen. We've got our phones put up. Everything is is away. I might see you at a sports show. Hey, Jeff, what's going on? Hey, let's get together and go fishing sometime. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. How are the kids? Okay, great. Everybody's good. And then you just go about your, your way. I remember the day I first met you. Yeah. You know, I walk up to you and you shake my hand. I shake your hand. We both look at each other. Same thing was going through my mind. Yeah, I wish I had time to spend with this dude right now. I wish all these corporate people weren't crowded around us right now. Jeez, it'd be nice maybe to, you know, spend an hour fishing to anything. Yeah. But what we were doing right. when we shook hands. Yeah, at ICAST in the middle of the floor. I remember that. And that was the that was the year of ICAST where um, kind of everybody was expecting that YouTube was, all the YouTubers were going to explode. Everybody's going to take industry. over the world. Well, I, I mean... <laughs> You know, the, the, the fishing industry is a good five years behind most other industries in terms of embracing whatever is new. Absolutely. That can be a really good thing for people like you and me, and it can be a really bad thing for people like you and me. Like for, for you, for example, I think you're way, way ahead, you're way ahead. Like what you were doing on YouTube early on, man, the companies aren't ready to embrace that and go for it. They don't understand it. Yeah. And it hasn't been proven anywhere else. It, you know, Red Bull needs to do something for about five years before somebody in the fishing industry decides, you know what, that I want to, we need to do that. Right? right. But for five years now, everything's changed. Right. Now, whatever they were doing five years ago, may, it might have been MySpace that doesn't even exist anymore. People don't even, like, what? Don't even know what MySpace is. I'll tell you something funny about ICAST. See, I, uh, I went to ICAST. Because people started asking me online, dude, you going to ICAST? You going to ICAST? You going to ICAST? You going to ICAST? I'm like, dude, why in the world would I go to ICAST? I'm a fishing guide. I got nothing to sell or whatever. But because we had the exposure online, people wanted to know if I was going to be there. So we made fun of it. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, we're going to go down there and wear a badge and wear a belt that has fish on it that I never caught and friggin' bring my lease truck in there with no trailer hitch. You know, we were like making fun of it. And we're doing that online. And the people in ICAST were starting to read the feeds and <laughs> laughing and going back and forth. And then we were laughing about it because that's what our content was all about. It wasn't about <laughs> promoting ICAST. It was about the poor guys that were working ICAST. They'd rather be fishing or whatever. Yeah. We're going to make fun of that for them, for always, the real guy. I always thought that ICAST, the time of the year that ICAST is, just like this weekend, um, is a great time to book charters because you take half the guide population and they go to these <laughs> other shows. So there should be there should be plenty of, of dudes around that you could take fishing this weekend. Well, the Miami Bill show is always good for booking a lot of uh, trips. You I know. guarantee you it is. Yeah, we always um, get busy this time of week. I mean, this time of year, Miami and Fort Lauderdale boat show. Same thing every year, my whole life. For whatever reason, though, this week, I haven't been to the Miami Boat Show in six years because this falls on the the state wrestling tournament. My kids were uh, wrestlers. So I have, I just basically said of every week of the year, I'll do whatever anybody needs me to do, but I can't be anywhere on this weekend. Like, like, I mean, you played college football and high school football. So, you know, like if there would be a, there would be a pinnacle of the season, like a whatever st state championship or, right. or your rival game or whatever that was this weekend. So everything builds <laughs> from this weekend. So if you're a ninth grader and you go to the state tournament, well, guess when you start training for the state tournament? The Tomorrow, like the day after for next year's tournament. So the whole thing, the weight cuts, the the peaking at the right time, everything, your your choice of competition throughout the summer, your choice of competition going into the fall, everything leads up to this one. So the year is built like this. And it was always right, this weekend, right on the right on the button. always this weekend. <laughs> so I was, I just, I haven't been, I haven't been since they changed it from the Miami Convention Center to this location. Yeah. And I'm interested to see what it looks like because, I mean, there's a lot of innovation in boating, and and I mean, one thing that has happened, I guess, is that people learned how to make transoms a lot stronger because now. There's like six engines on the back of these <laughs> on the, these boats. Seriously, I saw one today on Instagram. There were six 350 or Mercury 400 racing engines on the back of this boat. Six of them. Yeah. So the engines keep getting the engines keep getting more powerful. Like you have 400s and 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 even more. But at the same time, the boat builders are responding to this going, oh, okay, well, if you can put 400s on there, now we can make a 65-foot boat or a 70-foot right, right, boat. or, right. I mean, and it just keeps going. Like, Well, you know how that whole thing started with the multiple engines? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the boat business is pretty volatile. A few years back, the uh, bottom dropped out of it. Yamaha, Mercury had these huge floor plants. Mm-hmm that people couldn't pay anymore. So what they ended up doing is they ended up taking the boat companies, consolidating them, putting them under one roof, and then so they could still sell the engines. Yeah. Well, they realized that, you know, some of these bigger 34-footers and stuff, they can put three engines on the back of that thing. Well, if you put three engines in the back of a 30-footer, you just increased your sales by 30%. Right. So they started putting three engines on them. They really didn't go a whole heck of a lot faster. They were a lot more inefficient. But it was great for the engine company, mm. and that's what kicked it off. And now boat builders, you know, are taking advantage of the theory and, like you said, making the 60-footers and stuff with outboards on them. But it, originally, that's kind of how it happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had, uh, I had a bay boat one time with two motors on it. <laughs> we didn't, I always thought that was not a good idea because I can hit plenty of stuff with just a single engine. Why would I want to hit something with two engines? <laughs> Dude, I'm going, I've been, I've been going backward and simplifying my life. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot to be said for that. Well, you can, you can, you know what you could start? You could start the, um, what's the Japanese lady's name that does the tidying up? It's a, it's a <laughs> national. Okay. Do you have Netflix? You yeah. got to check this out. So there's this show on there called tidying up and I haven't seen it, but it, there's a the Japanese lady and her whole deal is that you pick up something and you say, does this give me joy anymore? And you say no, and it goes right in the bin and out to the out to the secondhand store or wherever you you send it. And people are going through their houses, and the secondhand stores are 
overflowing with with stuff it's the greatest time to to own a secondhand store of ever and it, this this lady has just started this big trend you could start the um get rid of everything go fishing with with one tackle box one rod and a trolling motor <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. I just had something come to my mind, but uh, <laughs> yeah, then I wouldn't be able to catch 814 tarpon in a day. Like we talked a lot about when social media was good and then how it kind of got where it's not so good. But one of the things that um, has happened over the years that is so good, starting with Tom Green and Phil Dance and all that, we've been able to build a network of people some of the best people that are real guys that are really into fishing, that are really into being progressive. You know what I mean? And big corporations spend millions to have a network, what we call the real guy network, which is the reason you and I are sitting here, which is the reason I know Joe, which is the reason we're able to tell a story about ICAST. And we can just go on and on and on and on and on. And this network of people is so solid and so strong and have so much in common and have the same views and messages. I was looking at your podcast list. I'm looking at the guys on there and I'm like, you know, fish with him, speak with him, refer to him, bouncers and idol. And I'm going down the list and I'm thinking to myself, all the real dudes on this list of podcasts I've are in my network. I can call them up on the phone. We walk by each other in the street. We we can talk and we laugh and we have a good time. You couldn't have built that any other way. Mm. Can't do it at these boat shows, fishing expos, you know, all that kind of tournaments. There's nothing. Right. So that's the joy of it for me. And to meet these people on a daily basis is crazy. I got to show you a selfie on the train to coming down here. You know what I mean? You ran into you ran into I walk real, in, real guys? Well, I walk in and there's three dudes sitting there and they're like, Oh, Jeff. And I'm like, Hey guys, what's going on? Oh, we're on our way to the boat show. I go, Me too. I says, I'm going to see Tom Rowan. And so I sit down with the three guys. I'll show you the selfie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we're talking, and these guys are into uh they're the Cabo dealers and stuff from, oh, cool. from Fort Lauderdale. Um so you know, we're in the train. There you go. Yeah, and we're hanging. <laughs> You know, and, and, and uh, my kid used to call it getting YouTubed, <laughs> like when she was like three or whatever. And I, we, you know, we'd be around town and she was, you know, barely getting, you know, where she could talk and understand what was going on. And she hated it all the way till she was like six, seven, because we'd be someplace doing our thing. Yeah. And somebody would walk up and they'd be like, oh, Captain Jeff, can we get a picture? You know, can we, can we talk for a minute? And I was, you know, always as friendly as I could possibly be. And the kid would get mad. And she'd be like, oh, dad, are you getting YouTubed again? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I was taken, you know, taken from, from our little time. Now, now that she's 13 or going to be 13 next month, it's cool. You know, it's cool that, you know, the kids yeah. at school know your dad and you can watch some stuff on. Yeah, but there's still a very fine line because all of a sudden you'll get YouTubed in the middle of doing something with her and, and it's not cool anymore. Yeah, well, you know, it's part but of that's it. that's partly because she's 13. Is that what you said? Yeah, 13. My daughter's 15. Yeah, there's there's a lot of. There's a storm of things going on inside of those little girls and, and yeah. things change quick. Yeah. You know, what's cool just a second ago is all of a sudden not cool at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning quick how not to uh, expect uh, to know anything now that she's getting to be 13. Yeah, well, it'll happen overnight. Um, <laughs> but then again, you'll be real smart again. And and I've seen both. I don't know. I, I heard so many uh, people tell me how much it was going to change. and. You know, after having two other, you know, I raised two boys before her that are both in college now. And, and so, you, you know, you kind of feel like you've seen a lot of things as far as parenting and stuff like that. But a girl's different. A girl's definitely different. And and even the two boys were different. But like my oldest son, he sees the things that we do now with my daughter or things that, that happened with, with my, my other son, things we let him do or didn't let him do or, or bought for him or whatever. Dad, the hell man. (laughs) Like, I'm like, son, let me just tell you something. I'm doing the best I can. Mom's doing the best she can with you. It was like hacking our way through the jungle, man. I mean, we got a machete in one hand. There is no path in front of us. We got a compass bearing that we're we're trying to follow. And we are literally hacking our way through the jungle with you. 
and we made plenty of mistakes. I'll admit to it straight up. We had no idea what we were doing. Every day was a new frontier with you. Then with your brother, we knew we, we knew a little. And so we know which, which of these battles are truly battles and which are a war. Which, what do you stand for? Which one do you really stand for? Which one's not worth bothering with? You know? And so we learn those things. And now with your sister, you know, we now have two maps that we've, we can follow and say, okay, well, we tried this with this one and it was not a good idea. We tried it with this one and, and it didn't work. So with her, we're going to go direct down the middle, you know, and, and do things different. And he, he sees it all the time. Like, why, why are you doing that? It's like, because we learned our lesson. I'm sorry that you had to be the Guinea pig, but you were, you know, but even with the daughter, it's like it's a little different, man, because she's a girl. It's a little it's a little different. And girls are girls definitely I, I definitely yield more to my wife than than I ever did with the boys. Like she's thinking, you know, I think it's gonna be all right. I'm like, I was a fourteen year old boy. I know what they're thinking. Like they're not fooling me. They're fooling you, but they're not fooling <laughs> right. me. I've been there and I know exactly <laughs> what's going on in their head. And and with my daughter, I'm like, I don't know. I don't think girls think like I thought when I was 14. I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> the, uh, I, tell, I tell you what, what I have done with uh, Victoria, Nick, a.k.a. The Worm. <laughs> the Worm. Yeah. And yeah. It, and I've it, seen her on YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> it's so crazy. But The Worm is a part of our social media because she wants to be there. Yeah. She likes hanging out with the fishing guys. She can sit there and say nothing and just watch and hang out. I took her to uh, Tampa with me when we did LunkerCon last year. We went to a uh, radio uh, studio where we were, you know, doing radio in the morning, and she's right there with us. She got to know all the people there, and they refer to it as the worm, and they're doing belly flops together. And and I think it's important, you know, kind of like how my dad did with me. I mean, I was just there. I was a little monkey that he had, you know, underneath, mm-hmm. and I would just cling on. And anything that he did, I was cool. Yeah. And, um, some of this, uh, stuff that we've been doing lately, I'm able to do that with the worm and she has fun. People see her having fun and can identify with her. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's longer dog's kid. That's the worm. You know, she's going to do, you know, some about cooking or whatever she wants to do, you know? So how long, how long is it until, um, she's not happy with being called the worm? (laughs) You know, I thought (laughs) that would ever go away or not. I I, I thought that would have changed, you know, by now. But I think she takes a little bit of pride in it because yeah. she's into the fishing. Yeah. And she knows that kind of everybody that, you know, I love has a nickname. You know, Lamont's got a nickname. Everybody's got a nickname. <laughs> if, 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 if you're with me and around me, you'll get a nickname yeah. one way or the other. <laughs> I don't know. I have a friend that, that uh, nicknames just don't stick to him. Right? We try and try, Can't get and, him try one? and it just won't stick. It'll stick for maybe a day or a week or something. But then everybody's like, nah. This guy, he deserves a better nickname than that. Like, we got to find something really good. And so for years and years and years, we've been trying to get this guy a nickname. And then somebody else will do something. You're like, man, you look just like a bobcat. Oh, bobcat. Hey, and then that sticks like that. <laughs> so crazy nicknames. We, we, I mean, all through the uh, YouTube videos, we got characters that we've had, you know, that are friends. They all got nicknames. You know, Lamont's got a nickname. So where, why, where, where's the Lunker dog? Where's, where's the, the dog part? Lunker dog? So, you know, the bar I was telling you about. Yeah. And I'd pull up there with the big snooks in the back. And we had a little patio out in front of the bar where guys would hang out and watch the fancy cars go through shooters and stuff. And they'd have their drinks out there. And I'd pull up and I'd have the lunkers in the truck. Mm-hmm. And I had this kid working for me, Jeff. Black kid, all gold teeth, you know, massive. But he'd check in the IDs for me. And the tourists would ask him, oh, what are those fish there? And Jeff would look at him and go, oh, those are lunkers, dog. Those are lunkers. <laughs> and then we all thought it was funny. So, you know, we would say that, you know. And then, you know, the business got a lot more serious and, you know, actually started marketing and stuff. And I had to come up with a cool name. And we were always laughing about Jeff saying lunker dog. So I named it lunker dog. Go, Lamont, what do you think about lunker dog? He goes, yeah, that sounds good. Perfect. <laughs> and, then, and then there it was, lunker dog. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, you, you can't, you can't you know, make this stuff. You can only make this stuff up. You can't plan on any of the stuff that's happened with the uh, names and the nicknames and the terms. Yeah. 
You know, I told Bill Dance that we were fishing with hog leg. <laughs> yeah, he, I bet he liked that. Oh, dude, he loved it. He <laughs> must have said hog leg a hundred thousand times in the two days we were fishing. Yeah, he had a good time saying hog leg. Lots of people do. It's a fun way to call. You know? Yeah, yeah. You gave me the shirt. I love it. Oh yeah, where, yeah. Where is it? It's right here. Yeah, this I brought you. A, I brought you in hog leg. We trust shirt because I think everybody that fishes down here, or one form, fashion, or another, uses hog leg. Absolutely. You know where they use a real hog leg hmm. in Louisiana? I mean, those things are like this, dude. I heard they catch giant tunas on those. They do, and, stuff. and they're That's huge. Cool. They're this big around, a real, hog and they're leg. like this long. That's real hog leg. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they are. They want the biggest one there because you go behind these shrimp boats and and there's you know there's a bunch of little fish, black fin and some small yellow fin, and then bonita and stuff like that, and then there are Anywhere between two and six, in my in my opinion, maybe they're more. But there's between two to six. Maybe you find a boat that's got ten. I don't know. I haven't seen it to where it, people in Louisiana are like, "What?" There's like thirty back there. Well, not on the days that I've been out there. I've I've only seen it to where there's like, you know, two or six or whatever. Or maybe they're deeper or whatever. But anyway, there'll be one that's bigger than the rest, and so you know tuna's mouth is like this but you're throwing a bait like this so you're going to get the big one and there's also like a zillion little sharks like a, a zillion so if you threw a a big pilchard or yeah, anything you, reasonable not, they're just going to crush it yeah, yeah you're going to miss the tuna because now you're hooked up with a bonita or something else so they want the biggest bait that they can possibly find and we found it i mean man you pull this thing out and it's like you know it's yeah the old hog leg yeah hog leg full on hog leg <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah and the, and the other thing that um through all this you know over the years one thing that we noticed if you wear like a hog leg t-shirt or rtd t-shirt or a sticker that i'm going to give you is the other people see that and they want to talk to you mm. because they know that you're into that entertainment they know that you can laugh they know that you're into fishing they know that and they feel like they have something in common with you and i get these emails and calls from all over the world Oh, I ran into this dude that had a lunker dog's, you know, shirt on. I went over and talked to him. He was so cool, blah, 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 blah. And I love that. I mean, to me, that's worth more than anything money can buy. Mm -hmm. Because our message was always to reach out to the real guy that's out there and try to give him something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just give him something to identify with. Give him something to laugh about. Give him something to talk about. Well, you've done a good job with it. So, so now the next step is is the podcast. I see you're launching your podcast. So, what does that mean? What do, what's your vision of the podcast? What do you think it's going to look like? Or sound like? <laughs> it's pretty heavy. Well, I didn't get into this. I got sidetracked. But kind of like what I was saying, like when, when we decided we were going to do this, when we first talked. We thought we had more time than we did. Mm. So I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to get Tom. I'm going to get him down here in Fort Lauderdale. He's going to see where I live. He's going to see where I fish. He's going to be able to identify what he's seen online with what we've been doing. And then we'll go down to the place where we do meet with our, our trip alive. Right. We're going to do a trip alive. Yeah. And we're going to have people come and people could meet Tom that wanted to meet Tom. And you were really going to be able to experience the original style of social media, mm -hmm. you know? And I was so excited about that. I was like, cool. You know, that's, that's how you do it. And then as, usual and it, it fell happens. on valentine's day yeah it falls on <laughs> valentine's day you know i'm gonna have more trips this week than normal because of the boat show you got less more less time than normal because of the boat show so we end up in a hotel room in downtown miami doing exactly opposite <laughs> of what i you know what i mean so, well, so we have we have your friends well, how many people doing, are on there i don't know i, don't, I forgot <laughs> we're even live again. but anyway and we're doing it because you know we, so we're gonna do stuff yeah. And we're never not going to do it, but it's not what, and the way I see the podcast going and the way I see social media going is this is stuff that's happened to us naturally because of the organic stuff. Like for instance, doing the live events, we've been doing live events for over a decade. And the first live event we ever did was at the Marina in Fort Lauderdale, 15th street fisheries. And I asked the people there if we could do the event and they said, well, how many people are going to show up? I said, I, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you know? So we do the event. All we did is say, hey, real guys come out and meet real guys and hang out with real guys. And the only live stream you could do then was Ustream. 
And most computers couldn't do Ustream anyway. Right. So website Mike, who I met on the Florida Sportsman Forum as a kid, who's still my website guy and very dear friend <laughs> and one of the best sword fishermen, has developed himself into one of the best sword fishermen ever. He says, all right, we'll try Ustream. I says, Mike, can you come down and your computer will do it and blah, blah, blah. So he's there and he's like a DJ except he's got the laptop. And he's talking about the comments and stuff that are coming in while we're doing the event. We do the event and I don't know, call it 90 people show up and we're floored. We're like 90 people. Sounds like a lot. It was, well, we, we especially back then. Yeah. We were like 30 people showed up. We thought it was going to be a lot. And we had 90 people live online watching on Ustream. This is, uh, all right, what are we in? 2018? 2019. So this is 2008, 2009. The only guy that had any traction on Ustream was Snoop Dogg. It's true. Anyway, so we go live and um, people show up and we're like, wow, you know, people actually showed up for this. We have to do this again next year. So we did, except the next year it was like 150 people. Then the next year it was like 250 people. Dude, we just did one in Tampa this last summer. We had over 500 people there. Is that LunkerCon? LunkerCon, oh. right. And all Lunker, Peter Mill actually named it LunkerCon. Mm <laughs> hmm. Because uh, people were talking about it. We used to call it the real guy event. Place where real guys showed up and met real guys. And, well, what do you do there? Well, we don't really do much. We just kind of hang out and have some drinks and talk. <laughs> and like I said, made something for that community. Mm-hmm. So now you go to a place like Tampa, 500 people show up. The guys that are looking to sell ads and sponsorship type dudes all show up. They give stuff away. We give stuff away to the kids. And there's this huge event. I only been to Tampa twice. Both times were to do LunkerCon. The guys that helped me do LunkerCon there were people I never met, but only knew through the network. Yeah. Who found the places for me, who found the DJs and the everything. Wow. Yeah. So the community of real guys puts together the LunkerCon and then people show up. You're never going to see LunkerCon on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram because I'm not going to pay the money to advertise LunkerCon. Right. right. Nor do I want to. Well, it seems like it's its own living, breathing thing. Right. It's for real guys that want to hang out with real guys. It's not for the algorithms that are, you know, right. being implied now. And um, I think the podcast, I think the live events, I think any time that you can give your audience a direct message and have them live that direct message with you. Why in the world would I go to LunkerCon? Well, I go to LunkerCon because I fish all the time. And my hard working son bitch. Get people that fish all the time work hard. Yeah. And they get nothing. You know what I mean? No recognition. The best thing we get is like when we go to like a, a good tournament and there's like a nice banquet. But at that time everybody's so worn out from fishing. Yeah. You just can't wait for it to be over. You just want to go I home and rest miss up. miss that banquet. That's what I'm thinking. Is there any way that nobody's going to notice it if right. I don't show up? Right. And all the real guys are put in that position. And that's our social position. Unless you go to LunkerCon. Hmm. You know what I mean? Well, no, I don't. I'm going to find out, though. Well, lots of people. Have... I want to come. Dude, I want you to come. But I think with the podcast is we can do like many LunkerCons. Like, I guarantee you that if we were able to go with our original plan and do this at Tarpon River Brewery, we're part of the network. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. You're the real guy network right. wants to host the thing and then invite people that want to meet you. Most of the people in the Fort Lauderdale area know Jeff and have met Jeff and see Jeff and you know, they're kind of Jeffed out. Right. But they find it really intriguing that, Hey, Jeff knows Tom. Yeah. And, and then bring in a couple of other people. I, I think that the live events are huge. I'd love to try it. I really would, because I see it happening in, in the hunting world. There's uh-huh. another uh, meat eater is doing that. And he just had about 250 people at the Wild Sheep Federation. And all they did was a podcast like they normally do. But people were there and they probably ask questions and they probably take some input from the audience or whatever. But people are into it and they want to be there. And it's another opportunity to, I don't know, it's an opportunity to get out of the house. It's an opportunity to meet people. It's an opportunity to put the phone down and and have a one-on-one conversation or at least listen to a one-on-one conversation. I think people are so thirsty for that right now, or there's a certain population that is so thirsty for that right now. And I think that's why the podcast world is 
is really, really popular right now is that people have had these little bites of information so much that they want something more. I think audio books are probably uh, selling faster than they've ever sold before. I think, you know, as, as, as popular as the small bites of information are, I think that creates a thirst or a hunger for longer form content. I don't know. I'm not doing it because I think that it's going to be popular. I started doing it because I like listening to podcasts and I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to get Bill Dance to sit down and talk for two hours? Wouldn't it be cool to, to find some kid that is just killing it and talk to him about what he's doing and why and how, and like what makes these people tick? Like, that's what I'm interested in. Well, I think, I think the power of the podcast has changed just in the last few years. And I'll tell you why is this type of entertainment you can get lost in. You know what I mean? You listen and you think, and you can kind of get lost in which movies used to do. And maybe a TV show used to do, and maybe YouTube used to do, but now you go and you search your favorite content on YouTube and you watch a video on the right hand side comes up a whole bunch of other videos that get you sidetracked, get you thinking about other things takes your focus off of what you're really into. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There was other things that people could do that when AM radio and some other things, whatever. But this whole idea, you know, selling ads and that you have to sell the ad to get the content to the people. It takes that away. It puts them in a different mindset and they can, they can identify, they can escape if they want to, but it's, it's for them more than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and that's like the underlying theme that, that I keep going back to on this thing is like, if this person's done it, then why can't you do it? Like, maybe you don't want to be a charter guide, but maybe you got something else you want to do. Maybe you're in a job that you don't really like right now, and you're wondering how you make this jump to doing something that you really want to do, whether that's being a fishing guide or a photographer or I don't know. Today, you can do anything. You can literally do anything. There is nothing that you can't do. And the internet has opened that up to us. And I like telling these stories and hearing people's stories because most people that have been pretty successful in, you know, on a different track than normal have a pretty interesting story to tell. Mm -hmm. And either they have burned the boats and decided I'm leaving myself no alternative other than success, which is really common. Like of that list of people that you saw, Like most of those people really, when you look at it and you hear them talk, they got themselves in a situation to where success was the only option. And when you get in that position, man, you get real creative about what you think. Like so much more so than if you've got a plan B, if you've got a plan B, you're, you know, if this doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. That's not how the guy that has no other alternative thinks. Right. The guy who has no other alternative says, if this doesn't work, then I will figure out what does work. If this doesn't work, then I'll just have to change my plan a little bit. If this doesn't work on and on down the line, but it's never, if this doesn't work, oh, well, <laughs> like right. it's and and all of those people just have, have told me that in some way, shape or form. And it, almost always is there this other theme of, weakness is strength. Whatever somebody thought was their greatest weakness, somehow in the scheme of things, and in hindsight, you can look back and be like, it's because of that, that I became really successful. It's because I knew nothing when I showed up someplace and I had zero experience that I put my head down and worked harder than everybody else. Because for 10 years, I thought that everyone else was so far ahead of me Or something like that. You know what I mean? It's like the one thing that you thought was your biggest weakness, you know, you'll look back. Ended up benefit you the most. Absolutely. I just did a, did a, a one with a, with a guy that, um, people know, and I don't want to spoil it for him, but turns out he has Tourette's. He's a fishing guy that has Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's syndrome manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Some people scream out, other people have this OCD behavior. And this guy's known for being really super OCD and paying attention to the details and being very detail oriented. And turns out the one thing that he, he had a problem with his whole life turns out to be his greatest advantage. Once he gets into, you know, being a professional fisherman that, pays attention to every little detail. And 
you know, you, you can't fake that. You can't fake that. You can't all of a sudden be like, I want to pay attention to every little detail. Well, <laughs> if you don't have that personality, uh, most details slip by, you know, like you're, you're just like a regular person. But I don't know. I find that to be really interesting. So do you, um, when are you going to launch your podcast? We're just going through our bumps and bruises right now. We actually recorded one this weekend or last weekend, I should say. And um, it was kind of a test recording. We're trying to figure out how to compress it to, we're in technical challenges. Put too much right. thought into it, man. I just throw it up there. Seriously. I, I mean, I think well, you're, well, I think you're right. And you got to realize Lamont produces everything. Yeah. Lamont is very he wants it to be the best he can make it well yeah. you know what i mean so well, what i did the mistake that i made in that in that regard is i just threw it up there and what i came to find out is that like damn i gotta buy some more storage to host this thing right and then next next month shit i gotta buy more storage to host this thing what is the deal and what i was doing is my file size was gigantic I think that's it didn't did. need to be gigantic it it in fact i got the file size that was recommended and I'm listening and I'm listening on these type of headphones and I'm listening on Apple headphones and I'm listening in my car. Like I can't tell the difference. Right. So in fact, I think the smaller file sounds better. So turns out I put it up there in that. And now I have 10 times more space than I'll ever need. So I could downgrade the, the account. So right. and it, it, I think that it turns out it saves you money, but in my opinion, the audio quality is paramount. It has to be, good that's why we have these headsets and it's a very simple thing we just use this one recorder in these headsets but yeah. these mics for whatever reason sound really good and i struggle so much with the telephone interviews sometimes i do them and i don't even want to put them out like it's <laughs> it just sounds so bad right but sometimes there's so much good information coming through the phone that i'm like okay well maybe people are going to accept this because what this person is saying is really good but it's just this audio quality. So I usually almost always apologize. I'm like, well, this is another phone one. Yeah. But it's always better to sit down, you know, face to face. That's the best way. And then the audio quality is better. The conversation is better, honestly. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. it. It's, I think it's going to be a, a piece to the puzzle. Yeah. You know, I, I think that, uh, but I know one thing I did 274 trips this year. It's a lot. It's a lot of trips. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of numbers that get thrown around. That's too many trips for me. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you it is. Uh, you you need. I mean, that's that's like being a professional athlete. It really is. Yeah, and I'm uh, you know I'm getting older. This decade flew by, and I'm not going to do it another whole decade like that. I mean, I love fishing, and I l really have some great clients that I can't wait to get on the boat with. But 274 trips in a year, the year goes by. And um, you're never going to get it back. Right. Yeah, you know I mean? Yeah. And it's the things that I think the podcast and social media can help me do. But I think more than anything is it's just going to help us stay real. Yeah. You know? And that's going to be our biggest fight, just like with the boating magazines from, well, two fights we fight. You know, everybody's going to fight for places to fish. And then this fight. Are you following me? The fight of, of who's authentic? The fight of being able to reach your audience, to be able to reach your group, identify with them, send the message to them, have them be able to send it back to you, and for us to be part of something. If 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 social media, if we don't change ahead of social media, we just become mm. another TV commercial, just another piece to their puzzle. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we're going to go through some changes. We've always been ahead. We're going to stay ahead. It's never paid us a lot of money to be ahead of everybody else. But what else are you going to do? I'm not going to, I don't have an advertising budget. I'm a one man fishing show. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I pay the bills by taking people fishing. I'm going to keep paying my bills by taking people fishing, but I'm going to grow my network the way we started growing it with real content for real guys that are doing real things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think you're doing a great job with it, man. It's, it's been very impressive to see that you're, are we getting ready to wrap head. up soon? Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, I brought you something that I really wanted you to have. I mean, I brought I brought Tom a couple shirts because I you knew he's three into, shirts. I knew he's into working out. You can never have enough t-shirts, right? But see the sticker. Yeah, we've distributed, and people have bought over thirty thousand of these stickers. Really, yeah. thirty thousand. Now it's taken you know it's taken like seven years for that to happen, 
and we take these stickers. And do you have a favorite five gallon bucket? I do. You take the sticker, you put it on the five gallon bucket, and then you have a certified five gallon bucket. Okay. So this RTD sticker, I want you to keep wherever you got to keep it until you get around your favorite five gallon bucket. And then do me a favor. Video yourself putting the sticker on the bucket okay. and send it to me. I don't care if it's 30 seconds long. All right. All right. I'll do it. So here's your sticker. Yeah, thanks, man. Check it out. <laughs> Run that dog. Yeah, I just want that's what we give the kids and we give the other fishermen that we see when we see them. We give them a sticker, we certify their bucket, and it's gone a long way. So I want you to certify the bucket. I like that. Yeah, man. I want that's you to I thing. want you, dude, uh, Joe and Luke went fishing with me one day, and the kids would go by while they were fishing, they'd yell, Run that dog, and we'd have them come over and we would put the sticker on their buckets and they thought that was the funnest thing that's that we cool. did when we were filming. So anyway, there that's you go. So cool. You got a certified right. five gallon bucket. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on there as soon as I get back. <laughs> um, I got just the place. I got, I got my, my charcoal gray bucket that I like very much. Um, and it'll go right on the side. Okay, cool, man. So, uh, tell everybody where they can find you if they yeah. don't already know. Yeah. If you, I mean, just Google Lunker Dog. If you're into fishing, you know, you'll go to my fishing website. If you're into YouTube, you can go to the YouTube pages. Real Guy Podcast is our new, you know, podcast. Good name. Episode. Yep. I like it. Yeah, Real Guy Podcast. Figure for the real guys. That's good. Yeah. I hope that you'll be on, be on my podcast and yeah. we do the live event like we were talking about. Let's doing. do it. I I'm hope in. this is a step to a long lasting relationship. Yeah, I'm in. And I'm flattered that you asked me to do your podcast. Thanks. I really am. I mean, it's guys like you that I'm proud to identify with. I appreciate that. That means <laughs> that means a lot coming from a guy like you. So before we give each other hugs and kisses, then we'll just cut it right there. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Tom. <laughs> I appreciate it. Hey, and if you don't know this, like you see people on YouTube and stuff like that, Jeff actually takes people fishing. I know that because he took my father-in-law fishing, and he had a wonderful time. Oh, and dude. He, he still talks about that day. And But you are a working guide that takes anybody fishing. You don't have to have ever seen one of your videos before. You I mean that's that's your business. That's what you do. So call call Jeff. Yeah. Call the Lunker Dog and go look fishing. up the Lunker Dog. Especially if you're in Miami, man. This this place is awesome. I don't know enough about Miami and I kind of have the same feeling as I did when I when I discovered what I had been driving past in Jupiter. Like I was like, oh, this would be a great place. Like if you were a family, like if you had a family that your wife and daughter love to shop and and you're hoping you could get in a half day fishing, I mean, right here. Just so you know, your father in law cut those tarpon into that bridge right over Did there. Did he really? <laughs> well, he's a pretty tall guy. I don't know how he fit up fit under that bridge. Not that little one right there. The one <laughs> over there, over there. And they'll be giving up the spots, Tom. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, there's probably tarpon under all of them. All right. So give give Jeff a call. And if you uh, if you're on social media, follow him. Follow me, Tom underscore Roland. And if you could go and like and what review and rate the podcast, that'd be awesome. Yeah, give him a good rating. All right. Thanks. All right. See you, Jeff. Thank you.